Hello, my name is Graham Steinhauer, and I'm the resident land steward at Madison Audubon Scoops Pond Sanctuary. Um, today, we're going to be talking about odinates, dragonflies, and damselflies, and a citizen science project that surveyed them in five protected wetlands in Columbia County from 2020 to 2022. I should mention before I start also that all of the images of dragonflies or damselflies you see here were taken by the folks on this team. So we're just gonna go over briefly some uh, life history things about dragonflies and damselflies. Some goals of this project are survey sites, equipment that we needed and you would need too, as well as a couple strategies that we learned, um, the results and products that came out of the project and about odinates in citizen science, hopefully about your own odinate citizen science project in the future. So relatively few species in this order, only 6,300 um, with 160 in Wisconsin. Um, before we started this survey in 2020, there were about 75 on the Columbia County list under the Wisconsin Odinata survey. So for their evolution, they're a really old group. Um, they first emerged about 300 million years ago. So that's a pre-dinosaur group. For habitats, the nymphs are strictly aquatic. And the adults, though they're not aquatic and obviously fly around, are still fairly tied to water because that's where they reproduce, though they can certainly be found in uplands very far from water as well. Um, as far as their ecosystem function, they are voracious predators, um, both as young, the young nymphs in the water or as the adults in the air. You can see on your lower left here, this skimmer nymph um, is devouring a wax worm that's about its size. But of course they are also eaten. On the right, we have an unfortunate Eastern forktail that has been attacked by a spider. Um, they're a large juicy meal. Insectivores really like them, especially uh, birds, maybe swallows, just because they're so large and nutritious. Um, one nice thing about them is that they're pretty much everywhere. Whether it's a stagnant pond or a high quality trout stream, you are likely to find odinates. So just briefly about their life history, they hatch from eggs um, and turn into nymphs. They will develop and molt over their time in the water. And eventually though, they will crawl up onto emergent vegetation or you might have seen them on the sides of docks. So they'll come out of the water, molt and emerge as their adult forms. Those adults uh, will mate and you can see this mating pair of green darners here and lay their eggs back into the water or surrounding vegetation. So I have migration on here, most Odinate species are non-migratory, but some of them are, including these green darners here. Um, a lot like monarchs, they have a multi-generational, about three generations um, during their 1500 mile or so migration. So monarchs get a lot of credit and they should, but they're not the only ones that do that. Some goals of this project were to um, collect some baseline composition data for our sites. Um, and then specifically related to climate, we're interested in the future how climate change might alter migration and studies are coming out now that suggest that dragonfly and damselfly morphology and particularly wing color might be changing because of climate change. There are 28 rare species in Wisconsin. And by rare, I mean, they're listed as threatened or endangered or special concern. Most of them are special concern, but there are, for example, one of the more famous ones, the Heinz Emerald. Um, we wanted to engage citizen scientists. We wanted to educate the public and ourselves, because like I said, we didn't really know what was at the sites and we probably didn't know about enough about the life history of Odinates in general. And then we also wanted to um, submit observations and data to the Wisconsin Odinata survey, which is the storehouse in Wisconsin for most of that information. So in the upper left here, 
is Goose Pond in 2019. It was the highest flood year that was recorded there. Upper right is what it looks like in a normal year, few feet of water, emergent vegetation. And then on the bottom was from this year. Um, the pond eventually did completely dry out and was dry for some months, basically still dry now. Um, none of those things by themselves are particularly surprising, except that this only happened over a few years to have the most extreme flooding we've ever had followed by complete drought just a few years later is quite extreme. Um, so that's one of the examples of uh, potential climate change impacts we're seeing at our sites. So here's a fall shot of Goose Pond. This is what it should look like in fall. Um, a lot of migrants using it for refuge. And then on the right, you can see our air photo. It's seeded mostly within an agricultural landscape. Schoenberg Marsh, similar shallow marsh, bigger though, at least 100 acres of open water plus the scattered wetlands around it. Um, the uplands are mostly prairie or grasslands. There are some woodlands and oaks. Otsego Marsh, another shallow marsh um, with more forested habitats in the uplands. Most of our sites are shallow wetlands that are fairly large and surrounded by at least some grassland. Wildland, again, large shallow marsh, a lot of emergent vegetation. Um, but this one you can see has a creek running across the west side of the property. And that's a trout stream. So we did pick up some interesting odonates in that area because of the different habitat. Um, and then you can see on our left here is JD, uh, one of our main team members who's really putting in the effort to find those odonates. Sometimes you just got to get in it. And then Mud Lake our last of five sites, a large DNR site, another large shallow wetland. Um, this one does have some ephemeral streams that run into it and it has the outlet of Rocky Run, but the, the large shallow marsh of Mud Lake is, is the, the main habitat type for odonates here as well. So some equipment um, is a net, certainly you will need a camera, you don't need the macro lens, but it can be really helpful uh, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. Binoculars are good if you are decent at ID and really good at remembering, but you can't take pictures with binoculars, so keep that in mind. Hand lens is good, field notebook. I'll talk a little bit about field guides and Wisconsin Note Not a Survey in a minute. Um, you can usually target or sweep net your individuals and by target, we mean you see one on the ground or on vegetation and you go after that one. For a sweep net, a lot of times you'll see a lot of damsel flies in a grassy patch, um, but they're sort of hard to pin down. If you just sweep net that patch, you'll almost certainly come up with some individuals. And then timing, probably the most important aspect of capturing the diversity. Some odonates will be active in mid spring, some in late summer or early fall, most of them will be in June or July. Um, so if you survey in June or July, those are great times, but you will be missing some of the diversity on either ends of the, of the calendar. And then one that I like, it's, uh, it's kind of like wood, woodcocks, a favorite perch. If you flush a dragonfly off of tall vegetation, probably better to not try to chase it down, but rather to approach the vegetation that it was on and get ready because it more than likely will come back. They seem to really prefer um, very particular perches. So these were some of our results. You can see we got quite a lot of species over all of the sites. It looks like Schoenberg Marsh um, was the winner as far as composition goes at 34 species detected, did quite well across all of them. Um, Goose Pond and Otsego Marsh were both somewhat lacking, and you can see that's mostly because of the, the damselfly composition. 
So in total, we detected 33 species of dragonfly and 23 species of damselfly. Um, none of our species were threatened or endangered that we found. One of them was of special concern, the slaty skimmer. Um, so we may do some additional surveying for that species in the future. A lot of them, though, um, have not de been detected in Columbia County for a long time. This is a horned club tail. This is one example of those species has not been detected in Columbia County for over 50 years. So to go off of that Wisconsin Odonata survey, we added seven species to Columbia County and eight of those species were updated. And by updated, I mean they have not been detected for at least 50 years. Uh, we put out several publications uh, to the public. These focused either on this particular initiative or on odonates in general. And then something else we're kind of toying around with is a listserv. Um, the odonate community is not particularly large, but we were thinking about ways to connect it better. And a listserv has been produced. We haven't been using it much, but we're gonna we're gonna tinker with that more to try to try to help connect people. So this certainly is one of the most uh, impressive products here on our right. Richard Armstrong put these photos together. Again, these are all photos that we took during our surveying. So this is a this is a team effort uh, poster, but it really shows the the diversity of color and, and the beauty of some of these species. So some identification challenges. Number one is capture. You will be able to capture dragonflies. You'll probably just fail a lot of times. You just have to try it. You will get them, but they are very fast. Um, damselflies are pretty slow, but they're smaller and harder to see. Age and sex is a big one. Um, all three of these images here are widow skimmers. The males will look different, the females will look different, and the juveniles usually will also look different. At least with this particular species, you can see the wing pattern is similar, but that is not the case across the board. In the stars, um, is something else that's that makes it more complicated. I talked about the molting, the nymphs molting into adults. They'll leave behind that exoskeleton or shell. It's called exuviae. You can identify that exuviae to species, but you probably need a microscope, um, some solid anatomy skills with odonates, and also an identification book. So it can be done. It's very difficult though. And on top of that, those nymphs will likely be at different instars, so they'll look different per species. So it, it is an option if you want to collect them and look at them during winter or something. I personally wouldn't recommend it. We didn't really do that because it is very difficult. I'm just putting it out there. Another complication um, is getting really good shots of the thorax and Circe. So some odonates, particularly damselflies, are really hard to identify to species without these two shots right here on the bottom. Bottom left is the Circe, the um, appendage at the end of the abdomen, the reproductive appendage. Um, and that sh particular shape is really important in identifying to species, as well as this picture on the right. This is a really nice shot of the thorax Often that will have a particular striping. Sometimes the abdomen done as, does as well. So both of these in combinations are a really uh, great pair to identify the slender spread wing. And then, like I said, you can identify the exuviae or the, the shells. Um, we know this one is a darner. We haven't looked very hard at it though, um, but you, re you really need strong identification skills. So tips for similar initiatives, recruitment. Um, we started out with quite a few people on our team um, because of that early enthusiasm. Some dropped out because they had other projects to work on or because identification was difficult. But we did retain a core team of folks. So if you're going to undergo a similar, similar initiative, um, I would recommend 
that you really focus on a set team of people who are enthused and willing to build their skills for it. Identification, I kind of talked about some, some tips for that. The timing, like I said before, going through the calendar year when node dates are active is big, um, spring through fall. Something I thought was interesting um, was the effort we had for those three years. And you can see 2020 and 2021, we detected a lot of new species per site in those years. And almost none in 2022 were new. Well, that means we found basically all of them in those first two years we detected maybe four in the last year. So that tells me if you're going to do a similar project, I would recommend that you survey pretty hard for two years to get that full species diversity. Um, I don't have effort hours to give you. So we visited each site several times for at least a couple of hours, but still the two-year recommendation if you're going to be surveying pretty hard. I I think would be helpful. And then for commonness, I mentioned all of our sites were more or less large shallow wetlands. You can see that about 12 of the species were detected at all five sites. These are really common ones, you'll find them. But about 20 were detected at only a single site. So if you think your sites are about the same and representative, I would not assume that. If you only survey one site, um, you're likely going to lose a lot of the diversity that you have at the other sites. And then for data and storage, Wisconsin Node Not a Survey does most of that for us. So that's quite nice. Team members would send their observations to me, and I would put it on a spreadsheet for our own records. But Wisconsin Node Not a Survey um, is really important for that. A few resources, uh, I really like this one, Dragonflies and Damselflies of the East. It's a detailed book, range maps, pictures, um, a lot of details on identification. But if you're just starting out and maybe just wanna look at dragonflies, I would pick something perhaps like Dragonflies of Wisconsin instead. Also an excellent book, but it has only the applicable species fewer details, but it still has the important ones, the pictures, the range, the flight time, et cetera. So these are all really good things. So the first four people that are listed here, um, Richard Armstrong, J.D. Arnston, Jim Otto, and Mark Martin were the major contributors to this project. So a big thanks to them for their effort and enthusiasm in it. Thank you to Wisconsin Own Not a Survey, particularly Dan Jackson for helping us um, with identification along the way. And of course, thank you to Wisconsin Wetlands Association for housing this conference. And I'm gonna leave you here with this, this shot of a green darner. Um, it just shows really the amazing detail and colors that some of these organisms had. And if you're not looking terribly close that you just might miss. So. This project was really interesting, getting us close to the animals, um, much like surveying any other biotic group might really give you some insight into it. Really enjoyed this one and would recommend you pick dragonflies to survey. If you've got any questions for me in particular, um, please send me an email at the address below. Otherwise, thank you for watching.